So please everybody have a seat and we'll get started with uh, Coin Agenda number nine, <laughs> over five years. This is our second uh, time in Europe. Our first one was in Barcelona last year. Um, I think it's a completely different crowd. There might be maybe, how many people were in Barcelona last year? Raise your hand. We got one, two, three. Okay, so it's a pretty different crowd here in Malta. Um, so we're going to reflect on a lot of things that have happened in the last year here in Europe. Um, Coin Agenda, for those of you who have not um, been to one before, uh, I started this five years ago uh, after starting Bit Angels the year prior with the idea of having a place where uh, investors and uh, early stage uh, blockchain companies could uh, meet each other, uh, learn about industry trends, and uh, also with the idea of getting the 99.5% of uh, investors who are not yet into the blockchain world to feel comfortable with it, to um, be uh, able to uh, figure out what's what, and to, to, to hear about it in investor terms. Um, because many times over the last few years, I've uh, spoken at uh, panels on venture capital trends or investing trends in, in blockchain, and it's been part of a larger conference that also included technology, uh, programming, you name it, and I would invite traditional investors, and they'd say, well, your panel was great, but I had no idea what they were talking about in the other panels. Could you have more investor content? So that was really the whole um, theme of Coin Agenda. And uh, our very first conference was in October of uh, uh, 2014. Uh, Bitcoin price had just dropped from uh, the crazy all-time high of $1,100 down to 300. It literally had dropped to 300 that day. And um, you know, a lot of Bitcoin is dead stories, etc. Obviously, if anybody bought that day, they're pretty happy right now. And um, so obviously we're, we're in an industry that it's very important to be able to understand the trends and the cycles as investors and, uh, and as regulators. And uh, I've had a number of larger uh, funds, uh, family offices, sovereign wealth funds say, we're very interested in this sector, but we're waiting until it gets properly regulated. And so I'm really pleased to be in Malta um, a week after they became really the first uh, European jurisdiction um, to be able to really provide the kind of clarity and sort of um, friendliness toward uh, innovation uh, that, uh, that is desperately needed in this industry. And uh, they're now looking to, uh, you know, uh, put Malta on the world stage for blockchain. I mean, there's pretty much, you know, three types of countries in, in the world as far as this industry is concerned. There's the ones who are afraid of innovation, perhaps overly protective of the banks in their nation, um, and just how many ways can we regulate it to death so that people leave? Unfortunately, the United States seems to be one of those places. Um, there's ones that just are neutral, um, and there's ones that are friendly. And Malta has shown itself to be a true friend to the, to the blockchain industry and is really stepping up big time this year. So it's my pleasure to start off. Is this too loud or, or is it seem? Um, okay, great. So um, first, before I introduce um, Abdallah, I want to uh, thank um, uh, my staff here. Um, uh, Stuart Queeley is going to be your moderator all day, and uh, Anamal Pena, who is our global events director, has been, uh, has been uh, running around. And um, also, um, I brought with my, uh, so Coin Agenda is a division of Transform Group, and so we also have uh, Zina von Nadel from our, uh, <laughs> from our Paris office of, uh, of a Transform Group overall, the, the PR division, and then also Enzo Villani, who will be uh, doing a couple of sessions tomorrow, who's the head of our strategies division. So uh, you'll get to know everybody here. Um, we have about 100 people at this show. Um, that was about the size of the first one. It was also the size of the first Puerto Rico event, and a year later was 600. Last year we had about 250. Um, I think partially because Bitcoin was going up and people were excited about, uh, about it, and it went from 1,000 to 2,000. Today it's at three times the price, but people are not excited because it's lower than it was in January. So it's this odd situation where you should be excited, I would think, if you're a student of history, to be buying when there's blood in the streets. And 
6,000 when it was 2,000 a year ago isn't blood in the streets and people who have been in the industry for more than six months' opinions. So we're going to hear from some of the top experts in the world, and we're going to also uh, hear from literally all the top people in Malta who are involved here, including, of course, tomorrow we're very honored to have the Prime Minister of Malta speak. So without further ado, um, Abdallah Kablan um, is a director with the Malta Stock Market and has been um, really one of the driving forces behind uh, this new uh, regulation and legislation and also just building the blockchain uh, community. Abdallah. Hello everyone, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, esteemed attendees, uh, organizers of Coin Agenda. Thank you so much for having me here today and for actually choosing Malta for uh, this event. It's an absolute pleasure to be sharing the stage here today and tomorrow with a number of such thought leaders, innovators, pioneers and thinkers in uh, the industry. My name is uh, Abdullah Kablan. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, founder of a number of companies specializing mainly but not exclusively in AI and machine learning and their application in fintech. Uh, I'm also an academic. I lecture and research topics such as uh, algo trading, deep learning and uh, computational finance at uh, the University of Malta. Uh, I also wear another hat where I am one of the directors of the Malta Stock Exchange where I also chair the Malta Stock Exchange a blockchain committee in there and a couple of months ago uh, I had another owner that was uh, also a responsibility added to my responsibilities where I become one of the advisors of the office of the Prime Minister of Malta uh, on issues related to technology mainly distributed ledger technology AI and IOT and I'm here today to speak to you a little bit about uh, what uh, we've done in Malta for the past couple of months. But uh, I've decided to change my topic just a little bit uh, last minute, because a couple of days ago I was interviewed by a media outlet. And uh, the interviewer, she was from Forbes, she asked me, how did you end up uh, in, in, in this place where you're actually advising on blockchain? And I suddenly realized that it's a little bit of a personal journey that um, I want to share with you here since I'm among such high level thought leaders in here. And uh, uh, it all started basically many years ago uh, by means of uh, background. My background, as I said, is in computer science. I focus on AI and machine learning in my undergraduate. But I've always been a little bit of a data nerd or a data geek. I've always loved building systems that do insight analysis, pattern recognition on large uh, data sets. And when I finished my first degree, I wanted to move to a field or to a sector that v was very or is very rich in, in data. And uh, this was around 2004, 2005. And uh, back then, and still is, finance is the richest industry when it comes to how much data acquisition, filtration, processing you can do on very large large data sets. So I decided to do a master's in financial engineering. That's where I got uh, really lucky because the gentleman that ended up being my supervisor is someone called Professor Simon Shepard. And Professor Shepard has a very interesting background. Uh, he used to work for uh, the Royal Na Navy uh, in the UK during the Cold War uh, in submarines deciphering Russian codes. <laughs> And uh, that was because he was a cryptographer and a cryptologist. And uh, it is extremely difficult to get someone who's both, because one makes the codes and the other one breaks them. But Professor Shepard uh, was specializing on, on both sides. When he finished his uh, tenure with the Royal Navy, he decided to apply his knowledge in cryptography to crack the financial markets. And uh, he started this financial engineering course uh, where he was teaching how to build algo trading systems based on cryptographic principles. He did very well for himself. I was really lucky to have been mentored and supervised by him. Uh, I worked as an algo trader for some time. It was very good to me. Uh, after some time, I wanted to expand my horizons a little bit. So I decided to do a PhD in computational intelligence, uh, focused on high frequency trading. Uh, and that's where it was uh, a really good time for me, but a terrible time for the rest of the world because uh, the financial crisis hit. 
so there was a huge demand for super nerds like myself to come and fo help solve some of the problems that were happening uh, in lots of the institutions back then. So when a lot of people were unfortunately losing jobs, uh, myself and my PhD colleagues were actually invited to companies to come and build uh, automated systems that would stop some of the losses that were happening back then. But that was also when I got a little bit luckier when it comes to my supervision uh, because my PhD mentors and supervisors uh, were Richard Olson, who's known in the fintech world as the godfather of high frequency trading. He coined the term high frequency finance and he wrote the very first book about it called Introduction to High Frequency Finance in 1993 before the technology even allowed it. So he was a little bit of a visionary and a pioneer in that sector. I had Professor Dietmar Maringer as well who was uh, one of the pioneers in computational management, Wing Long Nig, who was like an authority in algo trading. And, uh, and I was really lucky to have been mentored by, by such big names. And the reason uh, I'm telling you this story is because I remember it quite vividly on one fine morning uh, during a supervisory meeting. Uh, I was given, like I am always given, a paper to review by my supervisor. Uh, but in academia, those of you who come from academia will understand this, they are a little bit snobby. If the paper is not <laughs> blind peer reviewed, if the author is not known, no one takes it seriously. But it was the Satoshi Nakamoto Bitcoin paper just a few weeks after its publication. And I was asked to do a review on that. And I was asked to do it tomorrow. Usually I'm given a week. <laughs> so I came back the following day after I spent the whole night reading that paper. I remember I was a little bit mind blown. Uh, I came to my supervisor and said, wow, this is going to change finance the same way the internet changed information. And he told me something I'll never forget. He's like, ah. This is too early. No one knows where this Bitcoin thing is gonna go up or down. But you did cryptography and cryptology with Simon Shepard. Can you please explain to me the cryptographic hashing algorithms described in this paper? And that was blockchain before blockchain was even coined as a term because the Satoshi paper, as a lot of you know, never mentioned the term blockchain but mentioned blocks of cryptographic hashes that are sequenced after each other in the form of a chain. And it was uh, so interesting for, for my mentor to have picked at a very early stage that the very interesting thing about this paper is this underlying technology. So I took an interest on the subject, for mainly purely from an academic uh, standpoint. Uh, I dedicated some of my time to, to research and investigate that. As you know, there weren't many references out there, so I could not add a lot of substance to my own PhD on this, but I had my own personal interest on the side uh, on this subject. Uh, I bought Bitcoin at a very early stage. I sold Bitcoin at a very early stage because no AI in the world would have predicted 20,000. I'll be on my own private island. If, if, uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, I've been active in, in, in trading cryptocurrencies since then. Uh, I moved to Zurich for some time to work with uh, Richard because he's also the founder of Oanda, very uh, well-performing prime broker at the time. After my PhD, I decided to set up uh, my uh, first company. Uh, it was an algo trading triggers uh, company trade, sending signals in high frequency. Uh, I set the company up with two other PhD colleagues of mine. Uh, we did more or less the same PhD for three years. We shared the same office for three years. We lived in the same apartment for three years, so we became a little bit the same person. So we said, let's set up a company together. It was uh, a very quick exit because we set up the company in January 2011. We ended up being acquired by one of our clients in November 2011. When you're uh, young and stupid and you get a very good offer and you can suddenly buy a house and a car, what do you do? You sell your company. <laughs> In hindsight, we shouldn't have, but uh, I personally picked up this entrepreneurial bug where I uh, decided to always set up my own uh, companies, businesses, grow them. Had a number of successful companies, had a number of big failures, uh, but I learned a little bit more from the failures than I did from the, the, the successes. Uh, my two other colleagues coincidentally decided to play it safe and follow the 9 to 5 lifestyle. 
One of them actually is chief data scientist at HSBC Cambridge. They just moved from Canary Wharf in London to Cambridge. He's doing really well. And the other one is heading an algo trading floor in uh, Barclays in London as well. So they're doing very well uh, for themselves. But myself, I decided to actually move more onto the entrepreneurial side. I also have a very soft spot for academia, so I kept quite active when it comes to lecturing and researching on these topics. In fact, the very first ever course at the University of Malta that had blockchain elements to it was a course that was designed by myself called Introduction to Computational Finance. And uh, it was quite intensive when it came to, to blockchain. This was at the end of 2013. Only two students showed up for this course. <laughs> And the University of Malta has a very weird rule that you need minimum three students to be able to, <laughs> to do the course. So I was told you can't do the course. So I ended up taking those two guys, mentored them out of class, and hired them. And I have to say they are still working with me until today. Uh, one of them is actually co-founder in, 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 in my latest uh, gig. So for them to realize in 2013 that this guy is not crazy, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite grateful to them. Uh, but as I said, uh, since then I, I've been quite active in, in, in the field, mostly uh, fintech. The, the, the way I got to uh, advise the government uh, on matters related to blockchain was uh, that, uh, like many other people in this room, including Steve here, we've been banging the blockchain door for, for quite a number of years uh, since, since you know, uh, 2013 my, myself. And uh, mid last year, it, well, it coincided with me exiting my, my third company. I wanted to go on a self-imposed sabbatical of doing nothing for a couple of months. I was expecting my first baby as well, so I said, listen, I'm going to take a holiday for some time. Uh, when the government heard that I wasn't doing much, so I got a phone call and said, listen, we heard that you're not doing anything at the moment, and we're taking the decision to move in regulating this space, and would love some help and assistance. And I, I, I felt quite honored and privileged to have been approached to assist in this process. So I spent the past couple of months uh, working with some of the most brilliant minds here in Malta from the legal standpoint, from the strategy standpoint, from the finance standpoint, coming together to try to set up a regulatory framework that is quite robust, that is quite efficient, that ensures that customers and consumers are protected. At the same time, investors will be protected in a manner that does not stifle innovation and, in fact, should encourage it. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I worked on the regulatory framework, but as technologists, we really hate the word regulation. <laughs> as soon as you hear the word regulation, you feel like your arms are being shackled, you can't innovate. But I think in Malta, we've come up with a brilliant structure whereby innovation is not being stifled. Uh, in fact, we've come up with a structure where innovation is uh, encouraged and uh, a mechanism where it, it would thrive. So we spent a number of months, as I said, putting our heads together. Uh, Steve Tenden here ha was a part of the process and a number of other uh, people. And uh, I'm happy to say uh, that Malta now is the first country in the world to regulate technology arrangements and services, starting from DLT, out of which blockchain is a type, and with a vision to move into AI and IoT uh, eventually. And this is quite crucial because when I was approached uh, to assist in this process, I, I am a technologist, so I asked for some form of creative control on the process when it comes to technology, because unlike anything that's ever been regulated before from a services standpoint, what we wanted to come up with in Malta here is a regulation for engineers by engineers. So we needed people that would understand the engineering side of things, the architecture, making sure that these systems that are being licensed or technology arrangements or DLTs are scalable, are secure, are architected in a way that we can build applications on top of them that wouldn't fail eventually. So we had to look at the technology first. We had to define the technology. We had to come up with guidelines and policies around how this technology should be built and the license 
licensing regime that would cater for every aspect of the technology being built. Then, if we are going to build an application on top of that, let's say a financial application, you get passed to the relevant authority and uh, let's take financial applications. We had the financial services industry being regulated by the MFSA for so many years and the MFSA has been doing a brilliant job at regulating financial services for, for, for more than 25 years. However, the laws needed to be revisited in light of this disruption that is happening on the DLT front and that is why we had to come up with a new law that will be under the Financial Services Authority, which is called the VFA Act or the Virtual Financial Assets Act, which will define the specifics that are centered around ICOs, utility token, security token, uh, financial instruments, how we distinguish between them, how should exchanges that are actually transacting these new asset classes be regulated, etc. So we ended up with three laws here in Malta. The first one is the MDIA, which is the Malta Digital Innovation Authority, which is the authority that is going to regulate such technology arrangements and services. The second one is the ITAS, which is the Innovative Technology Arrangements and Services Law, the one that defines what is a technology arrangement, what is a technology service, and how will this fit within the vision of DLT. And as I said, initially it's exclusive to DLT, but the law will be flexible enough to eventually define things like artificial intelligence. And that becomes a little bit of a bigger argument, because an artificial intelligence, if it's something that can potentially harm you, financially or physically, then you need to actually update the laws accordingly. And the third one is the VFA Act, which is the Virtual Financial Assets Act. And the three laws were approved finally in the third vote in Parliament uh, late last week. So I'm happy to say that now, compared to any other jurisdiction in the world, Malta is the first country that has looked at it from a technology-centric standpoint. We have not focused on the financial element to it and built regulation around that. We started with the technology and we branched out to the financial services. For example, we have a very thriving iGaming industry here in Malta that is regulated by the MGA or the Malta Gaming Authority. The Malta Gaming Authority as well issued new uh, guidelines or a sandbox uh, kind of mechanism where any company that wants to innovate in the blockchain or, the, or to use cryptocurrencies, they have to follow or be uh, regulated within some form of sandbox uh, structure and so on and so forth. And, and, uh, uh, it, it, we are already seeing the, the results of that. Some of the biggest corporations in the world have either announced moving to Malta or are exploring moving here to Malta because we finally have created some form of certainty by having a government body that would regulate such arrangements and services that these companies wanted to be regulated around. But for us here in Malta, this is also very beneficial because like this, we've created a framework that will be the seed for a thriving ecosystem ecosystem that will get some of the biggest minds to gravitate towards Malta, some of the biggest corporations to gravitate towards Malta, some talented people to come to Malta, and obviously some capital to come and invest in projects that are uh, based out of uh, Malta here. It is uh, just the beginning. I mean, the laws are, are just uh, just freshly <laughs> voted for uh, just last week, but we're already seeing the, the impact. I mean, on a personal level, um, not a single week passes where I don't uh, meet with a number of people that have flown halfway across the world to come and explore setting up some of their projects here. I'm meeting a lot of venture capitalists that are coming here that are now ready to invest in projects because they are being regulated. And if you think of the ICO market, for example, the past year, two years, you could go and raise 30, 40, 50 million from 50,000 people, each one will give you 1,000, 2,000 each because the, the real big institutional players have not moved into this, this uh, game yet because it's, it wasn't regulated. As soon as we announced regulating this, we notice a new breed of investors, the institutional kind of investors or the venture capitalists that are willing to assist those companies uh, raise all the money that they're looking for. But again, the VC is a different uh, type of, of, uh, of investor altogether. Usually VCs prefer equity. So we're noticing a new type of products evolving around this area, such as 
the ETO or the STO, the equity token uh, offering, whereby you tokenize the company shares. The company share ownership is registered via a smart contract on the blockchain, and these are listed on a stock exchange. And as a director of the Malta Stock Exchange, even at the Malta Stock Exchange, we're getting requests from a lot of big companies checking whether we have some form of equity token offering mechanism or not. So we actually need to uh, speed up our own processes and explore these new markets quite rapidly because we've announced the regulation. Now we need to, to keep up with that. Uh, along or among all these, these, these uh, exciting developments that are happening here in Malta, the government wanted to have an event that's going to be the government's official celebration that Malta is the first country in the world to regulate technology arrangements and services. And for this reason, Delta Summit, or the idea of Delta Summit was born. Delta Summit is the Maltese government's official event where we're going to have all the regulators of Malta, from the Malta Financial Services Authority to the Malta Gaming Authority to the Malta Communication Authority to the new regulator, the MDIA, the Malta Digital Innovation Authority all coming together with some of the biggest corporations that have announced moving to Malta or as I said are exploring moving here to Malta and a number of other big projects that are currently looking at Malta as a jurisdiction coming under one roof, networking with each other, discussing uh, regulation with each other and at the same time we'll have some of the world's top thought leaders, innovators, pioneers, entrepreneurs and minds from all over the world coming to share their ideas, thoughts, and insights. We have uh, the co-founder of Wikipedia, Larry Sanger, coming here, Tim Draper. We have CZ, uh, CEO of uh, Binance, a number of other big names that will be here in Malta for the Delta Summit between the 3rd and 5th of October. So I invite everyone here to be a part of uh, the Delta Summit in October and uh, come and interact with all these big companies, big names. And this is a part of an entire ecosystem that that, that we are creating. I mean, we have a number of other big events that are happening throughout that month. I mean, I have my friends from the Malta Blockchain Summit, which is happening in November as well here. So for those of you who cannot make it in October, I invite you to, 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 to come here in November. But to join our movement here in Malta as a country, as a nation that is innovating in this space, that is pioneering. And uh, like uh, our Prime Minister, Dr. Joseph Muscat said, we are the trailblazers in this uh, industry. So please, uh, all of you, I'd love to see you, as I said, in October 3rd to 5th at Delta Summit. Uh, and uh, see you all there. And thank you very much for listening for me today. Thank you. <laughs> Great talk. We have time for a couple questions. So if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone around. Don't be shy. Yeah. And if you could just tell us uh, the name of your company and where you're from. Obviously, I know, but uh, just for the rest of the people. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Enzo Villani from uh, Transform Group, and I advise um, the, I'm actually chairman of, of the kind of advisory board for DBOT Trading, which is one of the first actual ATSs in the US, um, l like you, I was a former, you know, stock exchange person. I worked for actually NASDAQ and so on. My, my main question for the Malta Stock Exchange really is, you've now set the rules. Um, how long do you think it's gonna take you to get uh, the blockchain trading applications and the opportunity to trade via the STO, the kind of, the, the kind of tokenized kind of securities, on the Malta Stock Exchange, uh, what is the actual time frame? Well, this is very uh, interesting that you're saying this. We have uh, an announcement that is uh, going to happen this coming week. Uh, I can't say much about that announcement, but uh, it's going to be next Wednesday. And it is in relation to some strategic partnership that we're doing at the Malta Stock Exchange to address this particular uh, point. So uh, tune in for Wednesday. Uh, it's going to answer your question. All right, questions. Again, tell us the company and uh, your name. There you go. Um, hello, Dennis O'Neill, O'Neill Capital Advisors. I just want to find out if um, if there's any industry standards that are starting to show up uh, on the on the forefront of uh, these security token offerings, because um, obviously, if um, 
if Malta goes ahead and and provides whatever type of um, uh, guidance or policy on uh, security token offense, uh, offerings, uh, will that be reflected in other markets? Yes. Um, so the securities market has, has been regulated here in Malta by the Malta Financial Service Authority for, for many years. The differentiation that we have now is, is on the tokenization process. And uh, the tokenization process is actually defined quite well in the VFA Act, which is the new law that has been uh, uh, approved last week. And uh, in terms of timelines, we're looking at it uh, to come into effect around uh, October, which brings us back again to the Delta Summit. The timing of that was chosen by government specifically for all these new guidelines, policies, and, uh, and uh, regulations to be ready by then. So at the moment, the Malta Financial Services Authority is addressing this specific security token offering uh, issue, and it's actually defining the policies around it, because what has been enacted is just the law. The law does not have the policies written and the guidelines written around it. We have guidelines for the securities market, but these have to be updated. So I'm looking at the next three months as the timeline where these will be updated for this market to actually come into effect. Yeah. Do you think that they'll be recognized by other markets? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't think I am the right person to answer this uh, question, but uh, we Where have some form of uh, passporting rights that come, come with that. So in the security market, you can passport your services in tokenized securities. I think you need to ask the MFSA. <laughs> Any other questions? Just raise your hand. I'll bring the mic over. Questions? All right. I guess that's it. Well, we want to thank you very much for being our keynote thank speaker this morning. You did a thank fantastic you. job. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. We have that time yeah. All right. uh, and what we're going to do is uh, he's going to be, be around for most of the day. So if you have additional questions, you can always uh, come up to him and ask him uh, during lunch uh, or this later tonight email. during our reception. Oh, it's not there. It's Abdullah Delta Summit. Yeah.